I'm about to make a traditional summertime Appalachian supper. I thought that you might want to join me because I'm gonna make fried corn and you might want to see how that's done. It's really easy, I'll go ahead and tell you that. I'm gonna read you a little bit before we get started. I already have some fat back. You can hear it frying over there frying, so I've already kinda of got started. But I'm gonna to read to you from Smokehouse Ham, Spoon Bread, and Scoopernong Wine by Joseph E. Dabney. It's about fried corn. Fried corn, that's the best, declared Ernest Parker. Mother used just enough grease to season that fresh corn, that and a little salt and pepper. Nanny Taylor Jones, who lived to be 103 years old and had a gorgeous lifetime view of Paris Mountain, South Carolina, was famed for her fried corn. It was the country butter she put in it. That's what made it so good, said her daughter, Lib Dabney, my sister-in-law, and a superb cook in her own right. For fried or creamed corn, mountain people insist on white corn. North Carolina's Beth Tartan quoted her chemistry professor, the late Charles Higgins, as saying yellow corn was good only for horses. In my experience, there are two key elements necessary to producing a delicious dish of fried corn. First, make sure you buy a superior sweet corn variety such as the traditional Silver Queen or the new super sweet varieties. Second, and almost as important, use precision when milking the ears of corn. If you use a corn cutter, try to slice off only the tips of the grains. Then use a sharp table knife to scrape the milk into your bowl. A better way is to use a sharp knife to slice open the corn tips lengthwise on each row called cream style cutting. Then use a spoon or the back of a knife to scrape out the corn milk. So the corn I'm going to be using tonight is fresh, just picked this morning corn, and it is Silver Queen. That's our favorite. Unfortunately, we don't have a place to grow corn these days. Um, since Pat passed away, we really don't have a place. But this corn was grown just down the road from me, and it's, it's, we've been eating it all summer. The farmer that plants it, he plants it in succession so that corn comes in about three or four times during the summer, and it is really good. So first I'm gonna show you how to cut the corn off the cob for fried corn. So before I show you the corn, right quick, I'm gonna finish my crackling cornbread. My pan's really hot so I can put it back in the oven. So I've got my cornmeal in and I'm just gonna mix in my buttermilk. And then I'm gonna mix in my cracklings. Make sure to get them all out. Some of them are stuck in the corners. It's that lovely sound you like to hear when you put cornbread in. Making a mess. Okay, let me pop that in the oven and then I'll show you how to do the corn. So a knife, a sharp knife works great, just like uh, Joseph Dabney was saying. I bought this, I don't know, years ago from someone when I was still working at the college that was selling, one of my friends that was selling uh, Pampered Chef things, and it's so that's where it comes from, and it works really well. It just kind of uh, slices it off for you all at once, so I use it to get the corn off. You could use a knife, and there's all kinds of corn graters and different things. In the old days, they kind of handmade them out of metal. So I scrape off the corn, whoops, and then, um, just like he was describing, I go back with a spoon and kind of scrape to get the rest of the milk that he was calling it. It's kind of like what you would do for um, cream corn as well. I've left some corn on the ends there, you can see. But what I do with the corn cobs is feed them to my chickens. So I, if I don't get every little kernel, I figure that they, they get a special treat that day.
I use this too, this little tool. I'm one of those people, I love roasting ears, like I said, boiled corn. It's probably my favorite way to eat corn, but I don't like to eat it off the cob, so we boil it. Matt just eats his, like, you know, holding the cob up and eating it, and I always get mine off like this and eat it like that. I think it's back from the days I had braces when I was young, and I think it's something I just during that time i couldn't eat it like that and somehow i got used to eating it not just directly by chewing on the cob anyway it's just personal preference you can see how fresh and juicy and milky this is like i said it was just picked this morning really pretty full ears too This fried corn is so easy to make that you could, um, I mean, so it's easy, like if you just, if you're just one person living at home, just do one ear or two ears or whatever, you know, whatever, how many you, you think you would eat, but, um, cause it's just so easy to do. It's, you don't have to have a real recipe as far as if you want to do it for a crowd, you just, you just cut off a whole lot of corn and have a big pan. Or if you just want to do it for one or two people, you could just do a smaller amount. Yeah, we'll go back and get those. Doing corn is messy, though, as you can see. It's splattering. I see some splatter over there. Okay, now we're ready for the next part. So you can see I have my fat back back here. It's getting brown. It's fat back or streaked meat. We call it kind of interchangeably both. It, what it is is it's salt pork, so it's very salty. So one way you could fry corn is you could definitely use some of this uh, grease from this and fry it in that. You could use bacon grease, which is typically what I do, or butter, or maybe a combination of both. You might do butter and uh, a little bit of bacon grease or fat back grease, either one. Sometimes when you're cooking fat back, they, it, it has a tendency to, to curl up on you sometimes more than others. So when that happens, um, I like to, I use another smaller. I love to cook cast irons really all I cook in. I mean, unless I'm doing a sauce or something. So I, I might set a smaller cast iron on top of this for a, like a press so that it really presses it in there and helps it get crispy and done. So I think I'll do that. Let me get one. help it hurry along. Back here in the back, I have some, I'm about to let them burn too. I need to cut them down. Cut them off. I just have some soup beans. It was actually some I had in the freezer that we had made. If When we make soup beans, if we don't eat them all, I pop them into smaller sizes in the freezer. And that way, like today when I was like, what can I do for supper? Well, I really want to have cornbread or crackling bread, but I didn't have time. I didn't think ahead and make a pot of beans, so I was glad I had those in the freezer. And it's only me and Matt eating together tonight, so that's plenty for both of us, along with all this other food. I'm also having another delicacy of summer is fried squash, so I've got my fried squash ready. I'll do the corn after I start the um, squash. Just it, it, it does really quickly, the corn does. Now, as far as the doneness of the corn, again, that's kind of personal preference, but to me, no more than like eight or 10 minutes is, is as long as you need to, to cook it for us. Anyway, that's what we like. Add me a little water to my beans. So to fry my corn, I'm going to use some bacon grease. I'm going to get a little bit of bacon grease. In there. And 
and to that I'm going to add just a little bit of butter. Check on our side meat and see how it's doing. Now that our pan's heated up a little bit and the butter and the bacon grease have come to heat and kind of melded together, we're going to add the corn. And as far as seasoning it, you just need to season it your personal preference. There are people who put um, sugar on it. I don't think it. I don't think it needs it. It's just so sweet anyway. If you if you don't have really milky or um, really milky corn. If you wanted to, you could add a little bit of water. You can do that. You could add a little bit of sugar, but like I said, I don't really think it needs to, to have any. And then, of course, salt and pepper to taste or, or whatever else you want to put on it, anything you want to. Having you come along with me to cook reminds me of if you ever watched Hee Haw, you'll remember Grandpa's What's for Supper Grandpa at the window, and then he would lean out the window and tell them, and it always sounded great, always sounded wonderful. So see, you can see how it's beginning to stick a little bit, so I might add just a touch of hot water to it. Not much, though. Just a little. Kind of help it steam along. Let's see, I don't think I ever added salt and pepper, did I? I better pay attention to what I'm doing. See our streak of meat getting some color to it. Okay, that one's done. 
So streaked meat or fat pork. I think it's, I don't know if it's an acquired taste, but it's just that some people really like it and then some people don't. So you may just have to try on that one and see, see what you think, if you like it or if you don't. We love it. I guess the corn's been cooking about six minutes, six or seven minutes, but I think I'm going to call it done. It just looks so good and fresh and good. So I'm going to turn the heat off of it. I think our squash is about all done, too. So since I do love to cook in cast iron, a lot of people ask me how to clean them. Like on this one, really, there was nothing really stuck down. Those were just loose little pieces there. So I could, I'll just wipe that out, discard the grease, and then wipe that out, and it will be good. If Like this one will probably have pieces stuck, so I'll pour some water in it, and I'll, I'll boil the water. And as I do that, it'll boil up the pieces, and then once I discard that, I will um, like rub some. We have an, like a, a rag that we just keep kind of. It's an oil rag. And we keep it in a Cool Whip container so that we just always use the same one. Once it's clean, I will rub the inside of it. It's kind of, it's not really re-seasoning it. It's just putting another layer of oil on it. I think we're about to get there. Add a little bit more water just to keep it from scorching while I wait on the cornbread. That's all we're waiting on now and for me to slice up a tomato. Tomatoes are the other wonderful thing that accompanies all Appalachian, my, at my house anyway, suppers and breakfasts to really breakfast and supper and dinner sometimes. So there's just nothing as good as a fresh tomato. So I've got the cornbread out. I'm going to slice this tomato and I think I'm about ready to call Matt to come eat. Be a feast, a real feast. So I hope you enjoyed cooking supper with me. I especially hope that you enjoyed the fried corn. Do you have memories about fried corn? Was that something that you eat when you were growing up or maybe you eat today? I have a wonderful memory about fried corn. When I was in fifth grade, my mamma Marie died, so I was pretty young. Pat was Pap's mother, my father's mother. But 
when prior to that, prior to when I was in school, she was my babysitter. She kept me for Granny and Pap. So I can remember being in her little kitchen in her little house. It's no longer there anymore. And she would let me stand in a chair next to the stove as she cooked. And I can remember her frying corn and then let me have some of it. That's just one of my most precious memories. So I hope that you'll share your memories with me. And I hope that you'll continue to drop back by often as we celebrate Appalachia, including Appalachian Foodways.